last time. We're going to start by proving that the square root of 2 can't be expressed as the ratio of two integers. The simple cause and effect relation says that the world will end if we do not shuffle, so obviously every day we must be shuffling. You may have found yourself accepting calling a letter even. If you didn't understand variables in the way that you do now, you probably wouldn't have accepted that statement. But what if we want more than one solution? Hello Sapios, welcome back to the penultimate episode of Let's Math It Out Season 0, where you and I went on a journey through the numberscape of mathematics. We talked about different types of numbers, even and odd numbers, prime numbers, fractions, bases, and their relationships to numbers, how variables can help us for simple and complicated problems, and now we are here to talk about something a little different. So far we have talked about things being things, one thing for another another a soul for a soul. But what did it cost? Quite a bit actually. We have been ignoring a gigantic part of mathematics, which is the study of inequality. What is inequality? Well, you know what equality is. It's when one thing is the same thing as the other. Here the prefix in means not. Not not not. Kind of like insane, which means not sane, and incredible, which means not credible or believable. So inequality is all about not being equal. I've probably shown you this symbol already. It's the inequality sign, a symbol that you use to show that a variable is not equal to something. So if I write x is not equal to 5, this means that x can be any value but 5. I mean, for all we know, x could be a banana. Well, usually we assume that if a variable is not equal to a certain thing, it'll still be that type of thing, just not that specific thing. It's like the Dimitri Martin joke, how bad say guess have to be for it to be an uneducated guess. You ask your buddy Chuck, hey, do you know what the temperature is outside? I think it's warm enough to wear a t-shirt. And then he responds, uh, I don't know, carrots? Well that's a pretty uneducated guess. Because it hasn't been carrots outside, it won't be carrots outside, and it will never be carrots outside. The best Chuck could have done is to give some number degree, but carrots are completely out of the question, right? Chuck was given a fact. The temperature is warm enough to wear a t-shirt, so it's at least not freezing, probably. Unless you live in Oymyakin. So the degree value was probably something more than 32 degrees Fahrenheit, or 0 degrees Celsius. So if the temperature outside is T, we can write this as T is not equal to 32. This would convey the idea that T is probably a number and it's not going to be 32. Another example is saying that variable x is not a triangle, which would imply it's standing in for some other shape. But back to our example with t is not equal to 32. This statement is actually not exactly what we want to convey because t is some number larger than 32. Here it can be less than 32. It is here we employ the thing I mentioned at the end of the last episode, the sideways peace sign. Okay, these symbols are not actually called the sideways peace sign, by the way. It's not called alligators either, though honestly, it really should be. I mean, imagine walking into a math class and the teacher says, All right, my students, today you're going to learn about alligators. How cool would that be? But reality is often disappointing, and these symbols are called the greater than and less than symbols. Like many things in mathematics, the people who created these symbols were very unimaginative with the names, and the signs mean exactly what they are named. It reads like this. If we write this, we are writing t is greater than 32. For the other one, we are writing t is less than 32. By the way, if you ever get confused about which symbol you're trying to use, imagine the sideways peace sign poking 
to a larger number, because peace signs are usually held up, and that means that the side pointing up is higher. Anyways, then the correct way to guess what temperature it is outside is T is greater than 32, because T is any number greater than 32. So the sideways peace sign is poking the T. So how does this interesting new concept work? What can we do with it? How can it help us? Well, inequalities in most scenarios work exactly the same as equations. By the way, you might think it's very weird, but we call equations equations, but we call inequalities inequalities, not inequations. So Karen, Chad, if you ever say inequations, you're doing it wrong. That being said, everything we've done with equations so far, we can still do with inequalities, but there are times when things get a little strange. But before we can know what is strange, we have to know what is normal. So this episode will now be an accidental review of how equality works. Remember our quick maths? 2 plus 2 equals x, and x minus 1 equals 3? Remember that these essentially mean that the left side and the right side are equal, so the left side 2 plus 2 is 4, which means x is 4. Or in this case, x minus 1 must be 3, so x, which is x minus 1 plus 1, must be 3 plus 1, which is 4. See, equations are like the steel bars you put weights on at gyms. Back when gyms were open. I mean, I guess I can't really know because I've never really been to gyms. Anyways, one of the key rules of gyms is that when you're putting weights on those steel bars, you have to make sure there is an equal amount of weights on either side of the bar. So if there are 30 pounds worth of weight on the left side, there better be 30 pounds worth of weight on the right side as well. If that's not the case, you could lose your balance and die. Or at the very least, injure yourself. But if you're weak like me and can't lift 60 plus pounds of weight because the steel bar is not massless, duh, you might consider taking off some of the weights. So here's the deal. We'll take off a few pounds from the left side, like five pounds. But in order to balance the whole thing, we also have to take off five pounds from the right side. When we do this to steel bars, we can call this balancing the weight. I don't actually know if this is the right term for it because I'm a mathematician, which means that with a good chance, I'm not someone who goes to the gym frequently. So let's hop on back to our mental gym and think about balancing our equations. We already showed balancing with addition with our quick maths, but it turns out we can do the same thing for subtraction, multiplication, division, which should make sense. As I already said in previous episodes, subtraction is basically addition but backwards, and multiplication is addition but more fancy, and division is multiplication but backwards. So it goes without saying that this should work for exponents too. Well, kind of. Suppose we write down x to the second power is 25. Seems easy enough, we just undo the exponent by taking both sides to the half power. Because remember, exponentception is the same thing as multiplying the exponents. Now, taking something to the half power is also known as finding the square root. So what's the square root of 25? I purposefully chose an example which comes with a nice round answer, and that answer is 5. So x equals 5. Easy, done, simple. Or is it? The strange thing with exponents, especially with the power of 2 and many others that we will discuss much later in the series, is that it doesn't work the same backwards. Here's what I mean. Remember what happens if we multiply a negative number by a negative number? That's right, we get a positive number. So technically x in this case can also equal negative 5. And we'd have a perfectly reasonable equation. That is to say x can be either negative 5 or 5. But the thing is, when we take the square root of a number, the result is always positive. There's no good explanation why this is the case, but that's just the convention. You don't say the square root of 36 is 6 or negative 6, it's just 6. So to account for this inconsistency, when we take the square root of a variable, we write that the result is the absolute value of the variable. This would give us absolute 
value of x equals 5, which means x can either be 5 or negative 5, so everything's perfectly balanced as all things should be. All these kinds of interesting things just happen in inequalities. For example, if we have negative 2x equals 10, we can divide both sides by negative 2 to balance the equation. We can divide both sides by negative 2 to balance the equation and have only x on one side and have x equals 10 divided by negative 2, which is equal to negative 5. But things are not so simple with inequality because if we have negative 2x less than 10, it doesn't mean x less than negative 5. It actually means x is greater than negative 5. The reason why is a little more intuitive than you might think, but it's also pretty hard to remember when you're just getting into inequality. Remember what we talked about when we were explaining the similarities between adding negative numbers and subtracting positive numbers in episode 1? That negative numbers can be thought of as a direction changer? That's why inequalities are affected by negative numbers like this. See, there is an underlying assumption with inequalities that there must be an order to the number system. It might seem obvious, but there could certainly be a system where you can't determine a clear order. For example, how would you order shapes? I mean, sure, you can use the number of size, but how about shapes with the same number of size, like different triangles? We can't really use inequalities to compare shapes, but numbers have a particular order. This means that we can use directions to signify which numbers are greater than others. So we can think of inequalities as looking at some direction from a certain threshold. Thus, we can choose to think about the numbers as being ordered on a number line. Again, more on lines next season. And think about inequalities as some part of this line. In our case, if we say negative 2x is less than 10, we're saying that the number negative 2x is to the left of 10. Now, if we are to consider what x can be, we can automatically know that x can be any number that is positive because a negative number multiplied by a positive number is a negative number, and any negative number is to the left of 10. But this is a little strange, isn't it? Right now, negative 2x is described as things that are to the left of something, in this case, 10. But our solution is to the right of something. That's because that negative number, again, is changing our direction of interest. So when we divide both sides by negative 2, we have to flip the peace sign, which gets us x is greater than negative 5. If this doesn't make sense, try your own easy examples. What about negative x is greater than 3? We're looking for numbers negative x, which are greater than 3, which means that x itself has to be less than negative 3 for this to work. Things get a lot more challenging, but a lot more fun when you start putting absolute values into the mix. But for now, I'd encourage you to explore this bit on your own. I'll talk about inequalities with absolute values more later on, maybe in season 2, which I remind you is actually the third season. Anyways, the next episode is our season finale. We'll be talking about something that's a little more larger picture than the things we've already talked about and how it relates to them. For example, what are some fundamental truths in maths? How can we generalize addition more than we already have? And how can this help us find other proofs for later maths to come? But this, and more, will be discussed in the next episode axioms and allies. For now, thank you all for joining me on this mathematical journey, and see you all next time on Let's Math It Out. Let me just give you a heartful thanks for sticking with this series so far, and accidentally reviewed the hardships you overcame throughout the season. When we are working with axioms, we're not playing around. This is serious time. If you could see my face, you would see my serious face. We call this the successor function. And here are our axioms. The only problem is we don't actually have everything that we need for proper arithmetic. 